Hello again, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Flying Pigskin Podcast, where we talk everything Bengals, and we got some good stuff to talk about this week. We got a Bengals win to talk about it over a team that is likely a playoff team this year, a team that has been one of the best teams in the NFL up to this point. The Titans have now lost two straight, but they opened the season with five straight wins, and the Bengals thoroughly beat the Titans on Sunday at home inside Paul Brown Stadium. The score was 31 to 20. Tanya, how's your soul doing? You know, you, you said a couple of weeks ago that we just come here and crush or steal no, your soul. soul. suck my soul dry, I think was suck really your weird. soul Probably. dry every yeah, Monday. Yeah, it was soul sucking. I mean, last season was soul sucking. Come on, let's be honest. And then the start of the season was just like, come on. But I've been telling you guys, I believe this team is so much better than its record. And yesterday, for the very first time, they looked like it. They looked like, they. I felt like that was a complete game. Um, they looked so... Good. I mean, obviously there are still mistakes, there's still issues, but on the whole, I dare you to tell me that they did not look like a good team. Well, I dare you to tell me that they didn't look like the best team on the field yesterday, right, Reggie? They absolutely did. And I was uh, saying in my recap yesterday, I was just waiting on the other shoe to drop. Like, okay, all right, stop playing, guys. Show me who you are. And they did. Yesterday, they showed us that they were a team that could actually close one out. And that was positive. Did you feel and, like it, yesterday, they, you, know, you, you, you know, obviously all of us probably sat there a little bit like biting our fingernails thinking they're going to blow this at any moment now, right? But you, you, just, you just said, Reggie, that they, you know, they looked, they finally were able to complete a game. And I don't know what the mindset change was over the last week or whatever, but they just look like a team determined to win that game. Well, and, and a lot of it was thanks to the efforts yesterday, Reggie, correct me if I'm wrong, of Everett Anderson and Kendrick McQuinterly or whatever his name was. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me everybody out there saw Keenan Singleton's recap of the game on Sunday night where he, he – legitimately made up two offensive linemen's names and acted like they were a part of the Bengals starting unit yesterday, just simply to prove the point that this offensive line yesterday was such an unknown, unproven group of guys. And so, you know, Keenan throws out four names, two of them were legit and two of them were just completely made up. And I thought that was a brilliant way to illustrate this offensive line situation for the Bengals right now, Reggie. Yeah, I mean, really, they had guys. That, it was funny. Uh, we had uh, Jim Breach on Sports of All Sorts on Sunday, and he was like, there were guys, you know, Quinn Spain, he was like shaking hands with guys in the huddle, like, hey, nice to meet you. And it's like, <laughs> now you got to play with you. <laughs> like, now you got you to gotta protect the, the quarterback. And it, it's funny because – if you play both sides, I guess you can say, you know, there were times where Burrow could have been sacked, but, you know, Burrow is Mr. Magic Man, so, you know, he made it happen. But that is just really, really impressive for a group of guys who never played together before yesterday to just go out there and, and open running holes, uh, running lanes, and protect Burrow enough to – let him do what he had to do, which was chop the defense up. It was funny that that, that uh, fourth down play that they went for it on, Burrow had forever and a day to throw. And I tweeted out, I was like, man, he must have thought he was like back at LSU with all the time <laughs> he had to throw. That. And it was very refreshing to see because he's taking a beating this year. Yeah, I feel I like mean, that was no, a team that you could like go, I love this team. Like I want to be a, a fan of this team if they can consistently play like they did yesterday. And I think they have the ability to do that. Now, I think I would caution fans of, you know, jumping right on and saying, this is what we expect every single week. I mean, I think it is what we expect every single week, but let's, I don't know. I hate the idea of like tempering expectations, but at the same time, 
let's be careful. You, gotta, you know, let's be careful that we're not expecting the Bengals to come out and beat really good teams every single week and beat them handily. But I think that when you look at the game plan yesterday and you look at how they use their pieces, even without Joe Mixon on the field, it was the first time that they played a game in a decade without Carlos Dunlap on the roster. Uh, you know, and the way they fit these, these pieces together on the offensive line. Uh, I'm just really, really, really impressed with the way that they came into this game. Now, I think one thing to note here is when you play the Titans, the Titans are so good on the ground. And that is that creates a way for Ryan Tannehill to be good through the air. But I think everything with the Titans is based on the ground game. But if you can get up on the Titans and force the Titans to go to the air and force Ryan Tannehill to win it with his arm, you put the Titans in a precarious situation. But, I mean, hats off to the Bengals for coming in, getting that early pick um, in the end zone, that, that uh, Jesse Bates pick early in the game. I mean, that really set the tone for things. Hats off to the Bengals for, for really – uh, you know, a lot of things. And how about Giovanni Bernard, guys? This is one thing that we didn't really get to talk about much last week, but Giovanni Bernard has come in and fulfilled the role that he's been asked to play with the Bengals this season. How impressed have we been with Gio? Totally, 100%. He looks so good. He looks so poised. He looks so, prof- like, just on it. I think I tweeted out something like, he is the man. He looks so good out there. And I just love his spirit that, you know, okay, Joe Mixon is clearly the guy the Bengals have chosen as their guy. They've given him such a huge contract, but here he is just, just fulfilling the need of that team and and doing it with grace. Yeah. And it's not like he's going for 200 yards a game when he fills in or anything. He's just truly, like you said, fulfilling the role that he's been asked to play. And he's, he does a lot of, and you heard Joe Burrow say this in a press conference last week, he does a lot of the small things really, really well in pass blocking. He does, you know, he just, he, he does a lot of the small things really well that really impact the team around him, Reggie. Yeah, his pass protection is, I would say, elite. Like, and it's, it's funny because, you know, he's not the biggest guy out there, <laughs> but man, like, the, the touchdown that he had, it was like they shot him out of a cannon. And when he is playing, he just it seems like he's playing at a different speed, a different gear than, than everybody else. And it's kind of refreshing when you see him out on the field. It's like, wow, like, why don't we see this guy even more? And I think, you know, that was something that I've, I've brought up in the last few weeks since we've, we've seen more of him. Getting him involved seems to be – very helpful for their success and his mentality, you know, he comes out with that, you know, marvelous stash every week and he just puts his head down and goes to work. He doesn't complain, you know, even though, you know, he's played, he's paid like a guy who should be playing a considerable amount of snaps. He doesn't, you know, go out there and complain. And I think, you know, Zach Taylor was complimentary of Billy Price yesterday, but really Gio Bernard is the same kind of guy that I think he loves to have on his on his football team to, to kind of bring things forward for um, what Zach wants to do and what he wants to instill in the team. Well, on that token, I got I to gotta pose this question. Where does Giovanni Bernard's mustache rank <laughs> among the best facial hair in sports, in pro sports? It's up there, man. It's, it's up there. It's, it's like really, like I was looking at it yesterday on the Zoom. I was like, dang, like that thing is almost like its own other person. <laughs> it's well-defined. I mean, it's because it's, it's definitely a part of his brand now. I mean, you know, Jimmy Butler had the facial hair going on in the NBA Finals. Uh, Ooh, that was rough looking, though. Geo's looks yeah, a lot. Geo's more cleaned cool. up and and yeah. defined. Yeah, yeah. I think he's got he's got Jimmy Butler beat. I, I don't know. You I men, have to... you men love like men love like seeing a good facial hair. It's like you're so proud of that guy. Like, way to go. That looks defined. Well, see, really I, I, can't, I can't do. I can grow. I can grow a beard, but once it gets once mine gets four or five days going, I, it just kind of to me it feels like itchy and. I just, I got to shave it off. You know, I, I don't mind growing it out for a few days, but once I get like Keenan Singleton level, like where you can kind of oh, see it. 
Oh, you know, I, that's another good one. I mean, I, I mean, Giovanni Bernard versus Keenan Singleton. That's a tough, that's a <laughs> tough, tough <laughs> matchup right there. You're, the, the men admiration of other men is like similar to women admiring other women's shoes. Like you, you're the, the facial, like, oh, I love hearing you guys talk about like. Yeah, but you can pay for shoes. You can't pay for good facial hair. That's a part of you. True. Maybe I would, because I would. So I, what? <laughs> how much would you, Reggie, how much would you pay for a mustache like Giovanni Bernard's? Look, I know some barbers that could hook it up. Like I could just, you know, go and get the, the hair piece and then just, you know, it's funny. One of my frat brothers, like one day he was like clean shaven like me. And the next day he pops up on Facebook with this like glorious looking beard. And I was just like, OK, OK, <laughs> nah, that that's not going to work now. So I, I don't know. I don't know that I would go that far. But, you know, hey, if if, if it was in reason, you know, not like a, a Carlos Dunlap house price, you know, maybe I would. All right. So I posed a question on Twitter yesterday and it was, what was the biggest non touchdown play of the day for the Bengals yesterday? You know, uh, I mean, obviously. Was it Tyler were, Boyd catching that ball like on his shoulder? That was, was a big one. And th there were several, I had to narrow it to four. I actually did not have that one in this and it, and it could have easily been a part of this and I said you know I obviously reply below if if you think it's another one but the first option is and the way I look at this is the impact that it had on the game mm -hmm. but you can see it however you want to see it but first option was Bates early interception first drive of the game right. for the Titans That's the second tone. option was shortly after that in the game, it was T. Higgins catch on the sideline. It was a third down play. It looked like Joe Burrow was throwing the ball away and T. Higgins somehow went up to make that grab on the sideline. It turned into a scoring drive. The next option was the fourth and four pass to also to T. Higgins. And Reggie, you brought that up earlier. I mean, it was a decision to go for it on fourth down. Again, that also led to a score for the Bengals. And then the other option I think was an interesting option it's a Burroughs wild scramble play. And realistically, it didn't do anything for the Bengals. It didn't do much for them. But no. what a what a play that was. What, what's your all's choice? We'll talk about that play in a minute. But your all's choice out of those options. I got to go. I gotta or, go or you can choose a totally different play. No, I got to go. I got to go. Tanya's, Tanya's is, is good. Right? And I think she can – she can keep that one for herself because she brought it up. But I think the um, the fourth and four, as you were talking about, because on this podcast, we've talked a lot about Zach Taylor and some of his struggles play calling. And if he called that play maybe three, four weeks ago, Burroughs probably sacked. Like, you know, it, it's a turnover on downs. And, and we're but as you said, he was so well protected on that play. Exactly. And I think that's the part that is critical in my mind, because not only was it, you know, it was fourth and four, but it wasn't that wasn't a play that, you know, was quick. You know, they talked a lot yesterday uh, post game about how they were dialing up plays to get the ball out of Joe's hands fast. But that wasn't one of those plays. That was like a five step drop. And it, he stood in the pocket for like three, four seconds waiting for T to hit the top of his route and fired that thing in there right on the money to get him out of the, out of the jam to keep the drive going. And I think that is huge because that's something that, that's something that Zach Taylor has struggled with with his play calling wise. And like I said, a couple of weeks ago, we probably are like, man, that – that was a dumb play call. No protection for, for Burrow all season, and you call up a play on fourth down that has him holding the ball for three or four seconds, he's going to get killed. And it was the opposite. Well, and realistically, it was an aggressive play call, too, just to go for it, it on fourth down. And then to your point, you know, Joe Burrow drops back. In his body language, there was no sign of, like, concern that he was going to get sacked. He dropped back, took no. his time in the pocket, found an open man, threw, threw a strike. Um, and you get, it looked Burrow, like he dropped back with confidently knowing that he, that his offensive line was going to protect him. And that was really something that, that was really something. Yeah. Cause you get worried. Um, I'm a long suffering. Well, I was a long suffering St. Louis Rams fan. And if you remember the quarterback, Mark, so now you're, Burrow, now you're a, a Los Angeles Rams fan, right? 
no, 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 no. We're not going to do that today. But um, <laughs> no, I was a so I was a Rams fan, and the Rams, you know, had the dynamic offense. They were the you know greatest show on turf or whatever. And then it went from Kurt Warner to Mark Bulger. Mark Bulger got hit so much that every drop back after a while, he had happy feet and he was skittish in the pocket and you worry about things like that when you have a quarterback that gets hit so much so to your point Caleb to see Burrow drop back like that on fourth and four and just him being like so unbothered about his protection that he was just able to look downfield scan his options and fire that dart to to Higgins that was very encouraging as a fan I'm sure Tanya was encouraged by that I tell you, there was a time um, a couple of games ago, I don't remember which game it was, but he was getting, Burrow was getting knocked around, knocked around, and I started seeing him dance around more in the pocket. And I thought I was worried he was going to get happy feet, but I will tell you that watching that play and actually the whole game yesterday, I thought this guy is so solid. How is it possible, we'll say it again, that he is a rookie and has only been, is what was that, his sixth game? What, a, what game are we on? Like, how can he just be that new in the NFL? No preseason. He's just out there with a team that has allowed him to get knocked around as much as they have, that he just keeps going for it all the time. And he just, I just don't get tired of him. And something that, I, I mean, you were talking about the best play. To me, there was a point where I saw Tyler Boyd go running onto the field. And I don't know if he just like stepped out of bounds, was running back to get to the huddle or whatever. He was like skipping. He was bouncing with this sort of like, almost like a boyish glee to be playing a game. And him, Giovanni, and um, and Burrow, and I mean, of course there are others, but to me, the greatest thing that I saw out of that game, and I know you're talking about plays, but the greatest thing I saw was this dis- this excitement to be in the game, to be playing. And instead of like, you know, it just felt like they were really happy. Um, At least a few of them looked like, it it just made me feel like, okay, I I wanna watch these guys because they want to be in it. Yeah, and that that says a lot. Um, I wanna talk about, and we talked about Joe Burrow's success all season long, but like, if we can get down to the nitty gritty of it and and Tanya, you know, you were in studio with me last, I think it was last Monday when I ran the graphic comparing Joe Burrow to some of the best rookie season starting quarterbacks of all time. Aiden Manning was one of them. Um, Andrew Luck was one of them. Um, Jameis Winston was one of them. Cam Newton. When you compare them to these other guys who started in their rookie season and had good rookie years. Now, Joe Burrow's a little behind when it comes to touchdowns thrown. Not not that much behind, like one-tenth of a per-game touchdown ratio, but he blows all of those guys away when it comes to completion percentage and yards per game. Is is that something, Reggie, that that is that that we think now now I mean when you look at those guys and how they how their careers ended up, you know, we've seen Cam Newton's career kind of take a downturn over the last few years. And Jameis Winston never really, I mean, he got it off the ground in year one, you know, had a few good, decent seasons, never really took full flight with his career though. But how indicative can this early season, early rookie season success be for Joe Burrow of later success? I think it's huge. And it's funny because yesterday he was, on the Zoom, and he was like, a much-needed bye week. And they were like, you know, some guys were like, Joe, what do you mean by a much-needed bye week? What do, you, what do you mean by that? He's like, man, mentally, physically, we need this bye week. He was like, I need this bye week. They asked him, what are you going to do on the bye week? Uh, Dave Lapham asked him, what are you going to do on the bye week? He was like, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and that and that's and that's funny because like I understand that because they put a lot on his shoulders, but he's also gotten better each and every week. So he's processing all the information that they're giving him, and the results on the field 
are some of the best that we've seen. I know we continue to do this comparison to Andrew Luck, but like really the, the numbers kind of show forth to compare what he's done to an Andrew Luck. You know, you mentioned Cam Newton. It was different with him. You know, he, you know, he's a different kind of quarterback than Burrow is. Jameis Winston, you know, he's also a different kind of quarterback than Joe is. But I think if you compare him to like a Peyton Manning, Peyton had his struggles his his rookie year and they didn't win a lot of games. I feel like, and he also had his struggles with with interceptions too, Peyton Manning did. But I feel like with, with Burrow, yeah, the team isn't uh, winning as many games as maybe you'd like to see, but he has a strong showing, I think, in these first eight weeks to show that He's going to be a very good quarterback in this league moving forward. You know, I love the comparison to Peyton Manning because I would prefer he have a career more like Peyton Manning's, I think. And, you know, I, I Peyton Manning's my favorite quarterback of all time. So he won't It has nothing me. to do with your alma mater, I assume. Nothing to do with the fact that he played for the Tennessee Volunteers. Um, but I love the, how well he's doing. I just think that it gives us hope for not this year, I'm okay. You know, we get to see some wonderful um, moments. We get to see some good plays. You get to see potentially a game or two that we go, yes, I'm really proud of that. But I think that I think that we, as long as the Bengals do not step on themselves, um, we get to see our future, and he, that future looks real good. Is Joe Burrow already? a top 15 quarterback in the league right now. Right now. Ooh. Week oh, whatever, wow. the NFL season week. Coming out of week eight of the NFL season, is he already a top 15 quarterback in the league? Like guys that you want leading your team I right would say now, probably. Next I think that a lot of people would take him in a heartbeat. Top 10. Is he top 10? Top In 10. the league right now. Let me ask you this. When you look at the, the list of those other guys that I, that I mentioned there, Peyton Manning, Cam Newton, Andrew Luck, Jameis Winston, three of those four guys made the Pro Bowl in their rookie season. The only guy that didn't was Peyton Manning. Cam Newton, Andrew Luck, and Jameis Winston all went to the Pro Bowl their rookie season. Is there any shot that Joe Burrow is a Pro Bowl quarterback his rookie season, this season? Well, they... they Am I getting ahead if of myself? We had, if we had one, because, uh, you know, they're, they're repurposing whatever that means, the Pro Bowl this year. But I, I, think, I think he'd have a shot if he continues to play like he's played and he, he continues to get better and better each week like he has been doing. I think he has a shot. Joe is at this point where whenever he drops back and makes a decision to throw the football, I think – as an observer, and I'm sure as a fan, you're pretty confident that when he delivers the ball, it's going to be, you know, he had that one play yesterday that that was, I guess it was an interception, but it got called back because of a penalty. And that was a bad decision from him. And those happen, but typically you really don't see him making a lot of bad decisions. And as a rookie, I think, Sometimes we might get fooled because he plays so well and he makes such good decisions that you're like, oh, dang, I forgot. Yeah, he is a rookie. That was a rookie mistake he just made with that throw. And that part is kind of – it's give and take with that. But I, I don't know, top, top 15 maybe, top 10, um, it might be too early for that. I kind of hope he doesn't make – well, if we had a Pro Bowl – I, I would kind of hope he doesn't. And I don't think he needs a lot of encouragement, but I like a hungry Joe Burrow. I like a guy who feels like he's got something to prove. I like, I like him wearing that suit because I think he's a guy who, if he has something to prove, he's going to prove it. And just, for, I, just go ahead. Go ahead. Not, I, you can interrupt me. I, I, that's it. I mean, I just think that he, I think he works well with the chip on his shoulder. I think he does. He is. He likes. He likes proving everybody wrong. Look what happened to him in college. And I want. I want everything good for that man. I hope he makes. 
gets every accolade, you know, that he can possibly get, wins every award that he possibly can. But I love the idea of him as an underdog just a little bit because I think he he works well that way. Just for reference sake, I, I found some random quarterback power rankings for week eight online, profootballnetwork.com. This is what they have as their NFL. And I didn't want to go by um, I didn't want to go by fantasy numbers because then you get into matchups and you get into whatever else, uh, you know, but I wanted to just go straight up quarterback power rankings. Here's what they've got <clears throat> for their top 10. Number one, Russell Wilson, who's had a great season. Number two, Patrick Mahomes. Number three, Aaron Rodgers. Four, Ryan Tannehill. Five, Deshaun Watson. Six, Tom Brady. Seven, Lamar Jackson. Eight, Matt Ryan. I think this is when we start getting into like, I think Joe Burrow could fit right in, right in here. Uh, nine, Kyler Murray, 10, Josh Allen, 11, Derek Carr, 12, Jared Goff, 13, Justin Herbert. They've got Burrow at 16. Wow. Um, and now th this Come is on, coming man. into this past week. These, these power rankings were coming into this past Sunday. You can well, he's 16 with a bullet. You, I, I, think, I think because of, of Burrow – playing more games like he started since week one you know the the Chargers had to ride Taylor week one against the Bengals yeah I don't know about I don't know about the whole Herbert thing I, yeah. no I mean Herbert does he look well I mean I'm not taking anything away from the guy but yeah he, he looks great too but but I think you know over over the the period of time you have to put Burrow above Herbert because he's shown a little bit more in more games yeah all right, I want to ask you guys about the whole Carlos Dunlap situation. You know, and, and, and I don't know. Let me ask you first. Let me pose this question first. Have Bengals fans, like, moved on from that, especially after the win on Sunday? I, I, I mean, yes. I, and I hate to say, like, I hate to say, like, we've totally forgotten about Carlos Dunlap. That's not, that's not the, the question I'm posing um, because he had a, a decade or more long career here in Cincinnati and it was a good career. So I'm not saying just totally forget about what he did with the Bengals, but have Bengals fans totally moved on from the whole situation. That was the, the trade situation last week. I hope so. I mean, I, I get, I agree with you. I think Carlos Dunlap was a wonderful, um, you know, person to, for this city and for this team. Don't take any of that away from him at all. But I hope that a win would soothe some of the, that, um, I, I, I want to answer that. I want to hear your answers to that question, but I also want to pose a question back at you, which is yeah. that defense um, played well. Yep. And, and that was the next thing I was going to get into there. And, and we'll talk about the defense who balled out yesterday. The defense looked really, really good. Only technically picked off Ryan Tannehill one time, but at one point they picked him off two plays in a row and neither of them counted and just really played really well against one of the most high-powered offenses in the league. And, it, and it's sort of a one-dimensional offense. And I think that's what teams have figured out about the Titans, but they don't mind being a one-dimensional offense. I mean, Derrick Henry still went for 112 yards on the ground on 18 carries with a touchdown. Ryan Tannehill still ended up with an okay day through the air. Even he was 18 of 30 for 233 yards and two touchdowns with one pick. Uh, but, you know, some of that was garbage. Some of that was late in the game. The Bengals playing a little more conservative, which at, the, at that point in the game, once they started playing a little more conservative, I was actually okay with it yesterday. And it's one of the complaints we've had. The Bengals defense played solid football yesterday, really solid football. Um, but if, if we want to, my, my take on the whole Carlos Dunlap thing is, now Tanya said last week that she thinks they – should trade Carlos Dunlap and apparently Zach Taylor and then the organization were in agreement with you on that. The more I thought about it throughout the week, the more I thought he's had a great career with the Bengals and he will go down as one of the greatest Bengals of all time. But in this day and age, it's, it's such a result. We live in a results driven world. We live in a fantasy football world where you, you just, all you care about with your fantasy team, you don't care about, what impact they have on the locker room. You don't care about what impact they have, um, you know, in, in team meetings and, and whatever else attitude wise, 
you only care what they can do for your fantasy team. And we get in that mindset so much when realistically attitude is, is probably is right up there with talent and right up there with what you can provide for a team on the field. And, and I think that there was a huge clash there. And at the end of the day, you know, you've got to have a team full of guys that are moving in the same direction. And he wasn't that guy anymore. Now, according to his Instagram, the videos he's been posting, he's happy. The Bengals got a little extra offensive line help. The Bengals look just fine on Sunday against a good football team. So hopefully fans have moved on from that. But Reggie, talking about the defense, about the defense's performance yesterday, I mean, what stuck out to you about the defense? Yeah, before I answer that, um, I did want to just put like a quick bow on the, the Dunlap situation. You know, it was interesting yesterday because on Sports of All Sorts, I had mapped out that, you know, I was going to start with Carlos Dunlap and his departure. And I still did, but it was weird. It felt weird after the game to like stick with that to lead the show because it was like, Man, it felt like, like you were digging something out of the history books almost. Yeah, and it, and it, was, it seemed it like it was. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, but I stuck with it because as Zach Taylor did when he called the press conference earlier this week, like Carlos deserved his due for his time in Cincinnati. And I felt like it did deserve being mentioned because, I mean, this was a guy for a little more than a decade who, was a a very good player here, a very big pillar in the community. And, you know, it's still a huge story here, but it's weird because it's like you ask the question, have we moved on, have fans moved on? When it happens, like, in a season and you're hoping and and praying that your team is winning football games (laughs) and then they actually win a football game, that pretty much, you know, if they had lost yesterday, there could have been some sort of a spin like, well, you know, they didn't have Dunlap. You know, the first game without Dunlap, and it was a turbulent week. It was an emotional week. And, you know, you saw it play out on the field after, you know, letting him go. Maybe, you know, some of the things he was saying about the locker room and, you know, all this chatter was true. But it's funny that winning kind of erases a lot of ills. (laughs) And so that that just kind of went right out of the window. But but it's one of the questions I think that we're trying to ask without asking it is, was he adversely affecting that locker room to the point that winning became harder, a harder mountain to climb? A harder Mm -hmm. harder with him than without him. And and was he is the team better off having moved on from that? That's what I want you guys to to answer me. Is that, do you feel that way? His 80 plus sacks in his career, his team leading, his franchise leading in the modern era number of sacks is not something to ever forget. I mean, he had a, a positive impact on this team and this community in his time here. And I don't think that anybody should ever look past that, but, but, if you're going to look at it from a narrow, if you, and, and I think you need to, I think you need to, we could look at that forever and ever and ever and say he had, you know, 80 plus sacks and leads the team in the modern era. But I think that when you're talking about a franchise that's trying to move in a forward direction, you have right. to look at things in a narrow scope. Can't get caught up in those stats. things in the here and the now and in the yeah. here and the now, the Bengals are probably better off with Carlos Dunlap being in Seattle, having a little offensive line help in return. And there was clearly a clash there. There's clearly a clash and it is hard to move forward when you've got a clashing between the present, the present and the past. Yeah. It's, you know, Zach Taylor's trying to instill his stamp and his footprint on the team and on the locker room and, when you have guys that, you know, are in the locker room that, I mean, it becomes divisive when you feel like the coach's way isn't the best way to get things done. And it was, it's weird because <laughs> Tanya on the, on the, the very, I guess, back end of that, I guess Zach Taylor gets the last laugh. It's like, look, 
I told you, if you buy into what I'm what I'm preaching and, and if you buy into my way, like I know what I'm talking about, look at what just happened on the field today. And does that make you think like, it, okay, this is all like pie in the sky, but if if the Bengals from here, maybe not this season, but go on to have a wonderful record um, and, and a, a, a really – you know, win a Super Bowl, win playoff games, whatever, whatever, under Zach Taylor, will this have been the game where he finally became the head coach? Mm. That's an interesting thought. Um, and, and I was actually just kind of thinking the same thing, that if you're Zach Taylor, and Zach Taylor is so matter-of-fact when you talk to him in press conferences, you're like, you know, how does this win impact the team in the locker room, and how do you feel after getting this impactful win or, or whatever the question might be? His answer is always like, "Well, we expect to win every game. We do, We don't. We don't see the. We don't see each win as this monumental thing. We expect to come out and win every game. But that's why we're here, right? I want to ask you guys. I mean, you know, along those those lines. If you're Zach Taylor right now, and and to Tanya's point, like, maybe maybe this is this this was the point this past weekend where Zach Taylor finally became the the coach the 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 undisputed, like, all right, we're behind this guy. Now, I mean, according to Giovanni Bernard a couple of weeks ago, that, that happened a long time ago. And, but, but as Zach, if you're Zach Taylor, do you feel more relieved that we finally got the results that we've been expecting for weeks and weeks at this point? I, I feel like that would be more of a relief. It has to be, right? Situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, you trade, the Bengals never – pull off any in-season trades. When you do something like that, you make a statement. This is my team. We're not going to tolerate this, this, or that. Look, if you're not in with this program, look, you can go just like he did. You know, not to even be harsh like that, but, like, really, like, I'm trying to establish a program here, and I don't need anybody going against what it is that I'm preaching because, you know, I think my way is going to get us to where we need to be. And when you trade a guy away, that makes a statement like, look, I'm the, I'm the lead dog here. And so. Now, and Reggie, yeah. to your point, not just a guy, you're trading away Carlos Tunlap. That's, right. that's not just a guy. No. Yeah. Like that, that makes a huge statement. Like, look, this guy is, we know who he is. He's respected. We're always going to love him, but if he can't get with the program, he's got to go too. So anybody else, anybody else want to, you know, want to buck up too? Cause you guys can, you guys can go too. Cause look, I'm trying to build this football team the way I think it needs to be built. And I'm, I'm believing that if we do the things that I'm preaching, that we'll win football games like we did on Sunday. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. I, I don't think that Zach Taylor made the decision to trade Carlos Dunlap as a – and it probably wasn't just his decision, but he was probably a big, big, big part of it. Um, I don't know if he made it as a statement move so much as this is what's best for the franchise, but at the end of the day, whether he comes out and makes it a statement move or not, it is a statement. He made a statement by that. And he, he kind of brushed it off. Like in the press conference last week right after Dunlap – was traded and it became official. Zach Taylor was asked, um, you know, what was the situation with Carlos Dunlap? Where did it go wrong? What were the disagreements? And every time he was asked a question like that, he was like, I'd rather just not discuss it. I'd rather move forward. And, and I think it's important to note too, Zach Taylor got on for kind of an, an impromptu press conference right after Carlos Dunlap was traded. That, that press conference was not scheduled. It was not supposed to happen. It was just like he decided, oh, I'm going to get on and talk about this. And I think that's important to note because otherwise, if he hadn't done that, it was going to linger. I think he wanted to put it to bed. I think he wanted to, to move on completely from that, stop getting asked questions, stop, stop from his players being asked questions about it. I think he wanted to put it to bed and completely move forward. So I don't think for him it was so much of a statement move, but I think it is going to stand as that you know, for all the time moving forward. But again, the Bengals defense looked really good on Sunday. I think one player who's going to be a very good player for the Bengals is Logan Wilson. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that interception yesterday. He's a guy coming out of Wyoming. And I talked to a guy right after the NFL draft who covered Wyoming, uh, who covers, currently covers Wyoming. 
And he said that Logan Wilson is like a star around that area. I mean, they, he said that Logan Wilson, they said they call him the governor. That's Logan Wilson's nickname in the whole state of Wyoming. They call him the governor because he is such a role model in that state was such a good player. He was a third round pick coming out of Wyoming. That's impressive in itself. He's already started to make a name for himself in his rookie season and, and seems to play really smart football. I'm excited to see what he does. Now he's a, uh, he's a linebacker. So I'm not saying that he's taking Carlos Dunlap. I've moved on from the Carlos Dunlap situation. You know, I'm, I'm just talking about the defense as a whole. He's going to be a big player. They've still got playmakers on defense. Geno Atkins, Carl Lawson, Mike Daniels, Mackenzie Alexander. I mean, they've got a lot of playmakers. Von Bell, Jesse Bates has been probably the best of all of them recently. Bengals have playmakers on defense, and it looks like they're going to be okay if they can play more games like they did on Sunday. Yeah. Guys, oh, so. What'd you say? It's guys? interesting. No, it's interesting because um, you mentioned Logan Wilson, and I tweeted that exact sentiment that you said about him being a player because and I of course made the joke I, it wasn't because um we have the same last name or anything like that but no like he has two picks already in his young career he had a sack yesterday I don't I think that was the Bengals first sack in a while and so he has stepped up in a position that has been a position of need for that team for some years now. It looks like they found a key piece on, uh, in the linebacking group uh, with him. So that, that's very positive to see that they have probably hit on one of those draft picks. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what he can do. I think Josh Bynes has been an a, a integral addition to this team. I mean, has been – in so many ways, not, not just his play on the field. He's a good player, but I think he is, he seems like such a leader. Uh, he, he has seemed like that in his post-game press conference. So you heard other guys talk highly about him and the things that he does and says, but I think he's been such a good addition to that team. But I mean, the defense, the, the Bengals defense, they can put together more performances like they did on Sunday. I'm excited to see what they're able to do. Now, and I want to ask you guys about this, the, the bye week coming up. How do we feel about the, the Pittsburgh game to follow the bye week as we start to wrap up the podcast for this week? You know, I, I think that the bye week, this is something that I remember talking to Keenan about before the season. I think anybody who's played football before knows how important a bye week can be because it really gives you two weeks, a lot of rest and two weeks to prepare for your next opponent. And in this case, it's a very, very important game against one of the best teams in the NFL. You could argue that the Steelers are the best team in the NFL right now, but certainly one of the best. I felt so weird rooting for the Ravens yesterday. <laughs> I even tweeted it to Tasha Stewart, who is one of, who works here and is the biggest Ravens fan. I, I don't even know what to say about the Steelers because I just run so hot about like, I just want to win. I, I want to see them lose so badly <laughs> that it's hard for me to even be objective. I think um, yeah, I see Tosh, uh, Tasha's rubbed off on you. Uh, you got your Ravens. No, it's a hatred of the Steelers versus a love of the Ravens. Well, I think Reggie's pointing out the fact that you're wearing a purple shirt right now. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. I am wearing purple. I'm just trying yeah. to stay away from red and blue right now. It's this close to the election. Absolutely. That's absolutely. fair. And you can so, say it's LSU purple, too. I could. There you go. Of course. I of could. course. I, <laughs> as a Tennessee grad, I don't, you're not going to like that either. So It's better, though. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's interesting. I feel, uh, I feel a couple different ways about the, the bye week. One is like, dang, they got this win. Like, don't kill momentum with the week off, you know. But then, you know, Burrow said that they needed the bye week. So, you know, maybe that just gives them some – confidence on the other hand you know it gives them some confidence to just you know have a good week of practice and and really just build some momentum into the bye week to play Pittsburgh because you know Tanya knows this these games are, are brutal I mean yeah temporary paralysis with uh, Ryan Shazier um, the one of the seconds, you know, the Monday night football game in Cincinnati like these games are, are brutal Tall, like they are, they are like 
So, but, you know, I think the, the win kind of gives you a, a, an excitement of renewing that, because the rivalry is so strong. You know, it, it kind of gives you optimism about the rivalry kind of returning to its, its glory um, because the, the Steelers have beat up on the, the Bengals for some years now. Yep, they sure have. And it's like, you just, I, I, I know that we probably talk about this, like, oh, every week is such a big week for Joe Burrow, but I am interested to see him play against the Steelers. And I have been waiting for this one for the whole season. Um, and I thank goodness I get to wait two more weeks, but um, I just, I'm waiting for this one. I want to see him against Ben Roethlisberger and company. I do. I just want to see, I just, I guess my hope as a Bengals fan is that this is hopefully the beginning of a different era where the Bengals will maybe not this year, but we'll start stomping on the Steelers the way the Steelers have been stomping on us for, you know, the last 10 years or whatever it's been. And it is, um, it is, as you said, Reggie, it is such a huge rivalry, at least for us here in Cincinnati. It is such a tough and, and hard nosed game. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to watch because, you know, I, Carson Palmer went down against the Steelers. You know, that's yeah. when that happened. You know, the people, you know, break limbs in that game. So I worry about Joe Burrow, but I'm interested to see him in that game for sure. Well, you know, the Steelers like, are unbeaten after, after this week. I mean, they, they beat the Ravens yesterday. They're unbeaten. Um, again, the Bengals don't play this coming week. They will face the Steelers the following week. And we'll see if the Steelers are still unbeaten when it comes to that time, because they do have to get past the mighty Dallas Cowboys first. Huh. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I will say that traditionally the Bengals don't do well off a of bye. Now, that's in the Marvin Lewis era, but the, the Bengals just traditionally coming off a of bye just are flat. So um, I'll be interested to see how that works from, you know, under this coaching staff too like it's just a whole different thing um but i don't like coming off a of buy and playing the steelers i don't like that scenario at all you know the there's the the analogy of, of pressure right like pressure bust pipes or pressure makes diamonds and i feel yeah. like you know pressure, pressure is kind of made a diamond out of out of joe burrow he's he's kind of you know i mean death valley playing in that environment you know playing at the shoe like he's not afraid of of these pressure moments and he doesn't fold and it it's you know you say what you want about Andy Dalton but like he's a great guy but in those big time games and those big time moments Andy had a, a penchant to not show up how he should show up and I think Joe is a different kind of guy and I think the fans kind of recognize that and I think it would be interesting to see him rise to the occasion against the team that, you know, I don't know if I expect them to win <laughs> against the Steelers, but, like, I do expect them to maybe have a better showing than they had against Baltimore this year. Reggie, I just don't want him to get hurt. I'm serious about that. Like, again, I was in the end zone when Carson Palmer was so severely hurt during a Steelers game. It was a playoff game. And, and I heard that sound, and but I, I just, I always worry whenever we play the Steelers, someone's going to get really badly hurt, and I worry for Joe Burrow in this particular case. I hope that offensive line can hold up. I really do, um, because they're a good team, and they could hurt someone. Well, that'll be two weeks from now, Bengals and Steelers. They do have a week off, and it's a week where Joe Burrow plans to do what, Reggie? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Good for him. Well, we'll try to do absolutely nothing next Sunday, too, and hope the Steelers can uh, somehow find a way to lose to the Cowboys. I don't know. We'll see. Reggie, did you see that Sunday night football game, Cowboys and Eagles, last night? That game was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the best way to describe it. That was one of the worst, most, that was one of the ugliest NFL football games of it, that I've seen in a long time. The best worst game ever. 
<laughs> it was it was fun to watch, but then it was like also like I'm cringing. It's fun, but I'm also cringing at the same time. So we'll see Bengals Steelers coming up in two weeks. And we'll look forward to talking and, and wrapping that one up here on the Flying Pigskin podcast as well. The Bengals 2-5-1 and one this season after 31-20 to 20 win over the Tennessee Titans. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Until then, who day? Who day? Who day? Who day?